hope we're all ready for another day. The Lord is good. Every day is good when you're able to get up. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, we need to praise the Lord for all of those things that we take for granted. Uh, this morning we are going to uh, finish our study of Revelation chapter 17 in this first session. Uh, and then we are going to continue studying uh, other elements of the syllabus that we have not covered yet. Uh, but we want to begin by having a word of prayer to ask the Lord to be with us as we study together. So I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us life this day. Thank you for the privilege of being here uh, and in full freedom, the opportunity of opening your word and studying it and understanding it and uh, with your power to proclaim it. We ask, Father, that uh, you will be with us as we open your word, open our hearts and minds, and we ask, Lord, that you will help us to understand the urgency of the time that we're living in. We thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to review a little bit uh, the river dragon concept that we find uh, in Scripture and specifically in Revelation chapter 17. Somebody yesterday asked the question whether uh, it would be possible to uh, conclude that there is a river dragon, uh, dragon concept in Scripture without going to the civilizations of antiquity to discover their view. And I think that uh, we have enough evidence that we could determine that even without the background from uh, archaeology. Uh, you know, if you go to Revelation chapter 12, you have a seven-headed dragon, right? And it must have seven mouths. Only one mouth is spewing out water, right? So then you go to Revelation chapter 17, and it says that the heads are mountains, and, uh, you know, the, the mountains are heads, and therefore what is it that's spewing out waters? It's the mountains. And, and the harlot is seated where? She's seated on, uh, on the many waters that are coming from the mountains or from the heads. So if you took Revelation 12, 13, and 17 and you put together all the idea of the heads and the mountains and the waters and everything, I believe that you could really actually figure it out without necessarily going to archaeology. Uh, you know, we, we don't depend absolutely on any source outside the Bible to understand the Bible. The Bible explains itself. Uh, but, you know, if we pray and if we ask for divine guidance, we are able to put all of the pieces of, of the puzzle together by looking at Revelation 12, you know, you have the, the seven heads, one head is spewing out water to drown the woman, and then you, Revelation 13, one of the heads is wounded to death, uh, you know, the waters are dried up in Revelation 12, so there you start to determine that heads and uh, that, uh, you know, waters and all of this must have uh, this concept of the river dragon that we're describing. So let's go to um, this subtitle, and I'm going to... Uh, backtrack a little bit. We're going to go through this. The ancients believed that mountains were heads of a great cosmic river serpent dragon. According to their view, the mountains or heads would spew out waters, we call them headwaters, which would flow down into the valley. As the river twisted and turned tortuously in the valley, it looked like the body of a great river serpent dragon. According to their view, when the river was at flood stage, it sprouted wings because when the river extends beyond its borders, it looks like wings when you look at it from above. It is of the utmost importance to keep in mind that in Revelation 12, 15 and 16, as well as 17 verses 15 and verse 9 and uh, uh, verse 9, uh, this is drawing on this ancient concept of the river dragon. But in Revelation, the river dragon becomes symbolic uh, in its meaning. The mountains symbolize kingdoms. So the heads are mountains, and the mountains represent kingdoms, in other words. And the waters represent multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. In other words, Revelation 17, you don't have this literal concept that the ancients had, the pagans had, uh, it, it's using that uh, terminology and symbology to uh, teach great spiritual truths. Uh, it continues a saying here, it is important to understand that the nations, multitudes and tongues and peoples actually form the body of the dragon beast. 
This is the reason why the harlot, this is important, is described as sitting on what? On a scarlet beast. But we're also told that she's sitting where? On the waters. So what is the conclusion that we have to reach? We have to reach that the waters are the body of the scarlet beast, right? Even without the ancient concept. In other words, the waters and the scarlet beast are interchangeable. And the waters, or dragon, are scarlet because they are filled with the blood of God's people. The reliability of this ancient view, as it applies to Revelation chapter 17, is seen in the fact that the seven heads are identified also as seven mountains. As we have already seen, in antiquity the mountains were conceived of as heads of the dragon beast. Are you following me so far? It is crucially important to realize that while the heads or mountains are spewing out waters, the dragon beast is what? Alive. When the heads or mountains, however, cease to spew out water, the dragon beast is what? Dead. See, the dragon beast is, is this entity that persecutes God's people. Thus the beast is alive or dead, depending on whether the harlot is able to use the head to persecute God's people. That is to say, when the harlot commands the kings to order their multitudes to persecute God's people, the dragon beast is alive. When the civil powers uphold democratic principles and keep aloof from the church or from the harlot, the dragon beast of persecution is what? Dead. Is this making sense? Now, let's go to our next section, which is really interesting. The three seven-headed beasts. The three seven-headed beasts originate in different places. That is the beast of Revelation 12, 13, and 17. Where is the, the dragon beast of Revelation chapter 12 seen? He's seen in heaven. Another sign was seen in heaven. Let me ask you, where did the controversy between Christ and Satan begin? And the dragon begin? It began in heaven. So you would expect this sign in Revelation 12 to be in heaven because, you know, it, remin it, flash ba it flashes back. Remember we studied? It flashes back to the original controversy in heaven. So you would expect the sign to be seen in heaven. Where does the seven-headed beast come forth from in Revelation chapter 13? It comes from the sea, which means that it rises where? Where there are multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. But the beast from Revelation chapter 17 rises from where? From the abusos, from the abyss. Now, we need to understand why in Revelation 17 this beast rises from the abyss. But first of all, let's take a look at this little chart that we have in our uh, syllabus, the parallels between Revelation 12, 13, and 17. It's very obvious that these three chapters must be studied together. Uh, look at all the parallels that you have here. You have seven heads and ten horns. You have names of blasphemy. You have a woman. You have a call for wisdom. You have nations, tongues, and peoples. You have persecution. You have waters. The waters are dried up. You have a was stage, an is not stage. You have a wound that is healed. You have a beast and a false prophet. You have lots of similarities between Revelation 12, 13, and 17, don't we? So we know that these chapters are definitely related and we must study them together. Now, why does this dragon beast arise from the abyss? There's a specific reason. In the Bible, the abyss is the abode of the dead. Notice, for example, Romans chapter 10 and verse 7. Romans chapter 10 and verse 7. This is speaking about the resurrection of Christ. And it says, Or who shall ascend into the deep, the word deep there is the identical word, abyss, where this uh, dragon beast comes from. Or who shall descend into the deep with what purpose? That is to bring up Christ again from where? From the dead. So where is the abyss? The abyss is the, the abode of the what? Of the dead. Another evidence that we have of this is in Revelation chapter 20. And you're acquainted with Revelation 20. 
it says that an angel descends from heaven with a chain in his hand and he's going to bind the uh, dragon in the abusos, the very same word. What does that mean that Satan is going to be bound in the abyss? It simply means that he's going to be bound in a place where all of the human beings are what? All of the human beings are dead because the second coming of Christ destroyed all of the wicked. Are you following me or not? So basically, uh, the, the abyss is the abode of the dead. Now, why would this beast arise from the abode of the dead? Because one of its heads was what? Was wounded. And now the beast is what? It is resurrecting to power again. Are you following me or not? You must connect it with, with the deadly wound in Revelation chapter 13. That's why this beast arises from uh, the abyss or from the grave, so to speak. Now let's talk about the seven heads of this dragon beast. The heads are mountains also, right? And the mountains are identified as kingdoms. <laughs> so you have this idea that the heads are mountains because that's where the river originates. But symbolically speaking, the heads or the mountains represent what? They represent seven kingdoms. The seven heads represent seven kings, but the word kings in Bible prophecy uh, is, uh, is used interchangeably with the word what? Kingdoms. And you can notice that in the references that I have there in parentheses. The heaven heads are, heaven, seven heads are actually seven successive kingdoms. Some have thought, and this is a theory that's interesting, but I don't think that it's uh, accurate. Uh, some have thought that Assyria and Egypt must be included as two heads of this scarlet beast. In this scenario, the seven heads would be Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, the Medes and Persians, Greece, Rome, Papal Rome, and resurrected Papal Rome, which would be the Eighth Kingdom. The problem with this concept is that Egypt and Assyria are not found in any of the lines of prophecy of Daniel and Revelation. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Revelation 13 all begin with Babylon as the first kingdom. And Daniel 8 and 11 begin with the kingdom of Persia uh, for reasons that I won't go in. But still, after Persia, you still have Greece, and you still have Rome, and you still have Papal Rome. So, so we, shouldn't, we should not insert Egypt and Assyria into this prophecy when it's not found in Revelation 12 and 13. Because Revelation 17 is building on what? On Revelation chapter 12 and 13. Are you following me so far? Now, others have thought that the seven heads represent the successive popes who have ruled since 1929. In this scenario, as of 2005, see this really worked back in 2005. It sounded very persuasive. And so I'm going to tell you the way it looked back there in 2005. In this scenario, as of 2005, the five heads which had fallen since 1929 were Pius IX, 1922 to 1939, Pius XII, 1939 to 1958, John uh, uh, the 23rd, 1958 to 1963, Paul VI, 1963 to 1978, and John Paul I, who ruled only about a month in the year 1978. And so in 2005, they said, the five that are fallen are these. The one that is, they said, is John Paul II, 1978 to 2005. And the one who is to come and will rule a short time would be Benedict XVI, who served at, as Pope from 2005 to 2013. Have you heard that, uh, that concept? It sounds pretty persuasive if you're looking at it back from 2005. But the problem is that Benedict resigned his post as of February 28, 2013. So the present pope, Francis I, is number eight in the series of popes since 1929. So as the speculation goes, Francis I will be the last pope because Revelation 17, 11 refers to an eighth, and Pope Francis I is the eighth pope since 1929. But this view can be discarded because Pope Francis is not one of the seven. 
because it specifies. The prophecy says that the eighth is one of the seven. By the way, this beast does not have eight heads. The, the seventh head counts as an eighth, but it does not have eight heads. All through the chapters, it's seven heads, seven heads, seven heads. It does not have seven. It does not have eight. It has seven, and the eighth counts as the number seven. The seventh, seventh head is identified with the number eight for a very specific reason. So Francis I is not one of the seven previous ones like the prophecy requires. So uh, this theory simply does not fit. Now let's take a look at the list of popes, what it would look like. Pius the 11th, Pius the 12th, John 23, Paul the 6th, John Paul the 1st, John Paul the 2nd, Benedict the 16th, and Francis the 1st. And now comes a real novel interpretation. A novel interpretation was put forth, this is 2005 once again, that before the election of Benedict XVI, it was suggested that the eighth in the series would be a demon disguised as John Paul II, because the prophecy states that the eighth is of the seven. <laughs> this view can be discarded for two reasons. First. At this point, a demon disguised as Pope Paul II, John Paul II, would be number nine in the series. Second, it did not happen. <laughs> Francis I is already the eighth pope since 1929, not a demon disguised as John Paul II. Are you seeing the dangers of speculating when we come to this? You know, guesswork, simply saying, you know, this is it because this seems to fit, it seems to work. Before the election of Francis I, Evangelicals and even some Adventists, I might say, had referred to a prophecy by St. Malachi to the effect that the next pope would be the last. Did you hear about the prophecy of Malachi? He's a Roman Catholic, by the way. That he, would be a black, that he would be black, and it doesn't mean that he would be racially black. Uh, black means that he would be the head of the Jesuit order, who is called the Black Pope. And his name would be Petrus Romanus. None of these things are true of Francis I. He is not the head of the Jesuit order, even though he is a Jesuit, and his name is certainly not Petrus Romanus. All of this speculation detracts from the power of this prophecy. The fact is that this prophecy has nothing to do with individual popes. The seven heads are not seven individuals, but rather seven kingdoms. All this speculation about the seven heads should be discarded for the following reasons. Number one, it comes pretty close to setting specific dates for the final prophetic movements. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, as Francis I is the last pope, you know, we're there, right? All we have to do is, uh, you know, look at him, keep our eye on him. And, uh, and so, you know, it, it comes to, to the idea that this is the last pope and, and uh, what if there's a ninth pope? Well, then people say, well, you know, John Paul the, the first only ruled for a month, so we won't count him. There will be ways in which they'll try to get, uh, to get by this uh, problem. Uh, second, these speculative views sever Revelation 17 from the previous prophetic lines of Daniel 7, Revelation 12, and Revelation 13. As we have seen above, Revelation 12, 13, and 17 are indissolubly linked. Ellen White understood the common thread between Revelation 12, 13, and 17. And notice this statement from Ellen White. She says, God has warned His people of the perils before them. John behold the thing, beholds the things which will be in the last days, and he sees a people working counter to God. Then she says, Read Revelation 12, 17, 14, 10 to 13, and chapter 17 and 13. Is Ellen White linking all of these prophecies? She most certainly is. In the third place, we know that the, the, all these speculations are not true. Uh, although the seven heads of this dragon beast are said to be seven kings, the words kings and kingdoms are used what? interchangeably in prophecy. Now this is a very important detail. In prophecy, mountains do not represent individuals. In prophecy, mountains represent 
kingdoms, not individual rulers. The popes on the list above are actually not rulers of seven distinct kingdoms, but rather leaders of the same kingdom, right? Finally, and this is very important, we already took a look at 1929, you know, where most uh, Adventists say, yeah, 1929, the deadly wound was healed. We know that it's the United States that's going to heal the wound, right? When it lends civil power back to the papacy again. So finally, there is little or no evidence that 1929 should be chosen as the beginning date for the sequence of seven heads. As I have clearly shown in another place, the deadly wound was not healed in 1929 because in Revelation 13, 11 to 18, we are explicitly told that the United States will be instrumental in healing the wound, not Italy. So are you understanding all these reasons? See, we need to look at these things closely. Now, let's talk about the beast's final three stages. The beast, and I want you to notice that it's not the harlot who has three stages, but what? But rather the beast has three consecutive stages of existence. And uh, here's a summary of what Revelation 17 says. The beast was and is not and shall be. Does that immediately ring a bell? Why isn't it? Why isn't the beast a persecuting beast now? Because, because what happens is, is the harlot rides the beast, she controls the heads, and the heads tell their multitudes to persecute God's people. The multitudes are the body of the dragon. Are you following me or not? So, so why is the beast not now? Because the waters are dried up. Because the papacy has what? A deadly wound. Will this power be again? So is it vital to understand that this, that this power had a past history and that now it is inactive because the secular powers do not allow themselves to be used, but it will rise again from the abyss? Is this making sense? Also, we are told that it was and is not yet is. Of course, a better translation is, uh, is this. It was and is not and shall be present. That is a better translation of Revelation 17, verse 8, that particular phrase. The same time periods are described as five are fallen. One is and the other is not yet come. The time periods are also explained as the beast who was and is not and even is the eighth. So what I want us to notice is you have three specific time periods here. A time period when this persecuting beast was, a time when this persecuting beast is not, and a time when this persecuting beast will persecute again. Does that square with the scenario of Revelation 12? Yes. Does it square with the scenario of Revelation 13? Does it square with Daniel 11? Remember in Daniel 11 you have this king of the north. He rules, he persecutes, he burns the saints, he kills them with the sword, he sends them into captivity, he, con he, he confiscates their goods, he does it for times, and then at the time of the end, a power pushes against him, which means that, it, that a power attacks him. That's France. And then what happens with the king of the north? Well, he receives a deadly wound, and then you read the following verses, and it says that he overflows. It actually uses the word overflows to refer to waters. And basically, it conquers the whole world. It goes all, you know, and, and, it, and it uses geographical terminology. It speaks about this power going all the way from Babylon. It goes through the Holy Land, and it goes all the way down to Ethiopia, Egypt, and Libya. That is the known world of that day. But at the end of time, we take what is local, and we make it what? Global and symbolic. Are you with me or not? That's the principle that we need to follow. Now, the, uh, there, here's another important point. The heads of the dragon beast do not rule simultaneously, but rather consecutively. Are you understanding that point? The heads are wounded one by one. We know this for at least two reasons. 
And I, uh, I meant to get you a copy of this uh, page from uh, ancient Near Eastern documents, uh, one of the documents uh, that was actually excavated. It wasn't a document. It was actually a, um, uh, an illustration on stone where, where, you have, where you have a god that has a spear and he's fighting a se against a seven-headed dragon. And with his spear, he's killed four heads and the four heads are drooping. And he's fighting with the last three heads to try and destroy the last three heads. Uh, it's very, very interesting concept. So each head that falls is a head that droops. But the last three heads are going to play a very important role in Bible prophecy. Uh, secondly, the testimony of Revelation 12, 15 and 13, verses 3, 5, and 6, tells us that there is only what? One mouth that is spewing waters out at any given time. Are you understanding this? In other words, are all of the mouths spewing waters out at the same time? No. no. They spew out waters one by one because Revelation 12 says that the dragon spewed water out of his mouth, but the, but the dragon has seven heads. Revelation 13 says one of its heads was wounded, but the, but the prophecy says that there are seven heads. So only one head is spewing out waters, and only one head receives the deadly wound. Now, let's continue here. The meaning of the seven heads. I believe that in the light of studying this uh, in connection with Revelation 12 and 13, we can determine that the seven heads are the following. The first head would be Babylon. Was Babylon a persecuting power against God's people? Yes. Medes and Persians, was this religious persecution, by the way, by the civil power? Absolutely. Then we have Greece. Greece was also a persecuting power. I could give you all kinds of references of what Greece did with God's people, with the Jews. The Roman Empire, was that a persecuting power? Did the pagan religion of Rome persecute the Christians? Well, it slew Christ and the apostles as well. Were the civil powers of, you, of Europe used by the papacy, the harlot, to persecute during the 1260 years? Yes. Will the civil power of the United States join with apostate Protestantism to persecute? Absolutely. Will resurrected Rome, when the United States gives it its kingdom, also link up with the kings of the earth and the whole world to persecute God's people? Absolutely. Now let's go to the next page. It will be observed that in this scenario, three of the last four heads of this scarlet beast are Roman. And even the United States will become an ally of the dragon or Rome because she will speak like the dragon or she will speak like Rome. And I mention here Matthew 24. I would suggest that you get the syllabus and the DVDs on Matthew 24 there is a very definite connection between the origin of the United States and their desire to be like the Roman Empire. It is amazing. It is in our architecture in Washington, D.C. It is on, on the, the, the statues in Washington, D.C., where we have statues of all our, our heroes, inscriptions in Latin uh, on our grand seal. Uh, it, uh, the numbers that are given are in Roman numerals. Uh, our, our armies were first called legions. Uh, we have the Senate. You know, we have all of these things that, that come from ancient Rome because the idea was to establish a republic such as the great republic of Rome. And so, and so the last four heads, uh, the, the last uh, heads actually are all identified with what? They're all identified with Rome. Now somebody might say, well, why would three of the seven heads apply to Rome? Isn't one head enough to represent the various stages of Rome? The answer to these questions is simple. The books of Daniel and Revelation themselves take up three stages of Rome separately, don't they? In Daniel 2, the legs of iron, that's imperial Rome, are distinguished from the feet of iron and clay, which is divided Rome and papal Rome. In Daniel 7, 23 and 24, we find a clear distinction between the dragon ruling by itself, the dragon ruling with the ten horns, and the dragon ruling with the little horn. And now comes the most important evidence. Furthermore, Revelation 12 portrays a dragon in heaven as a symbol for pagan Rome, 
Revelation 13 uses a composite beast from the sea to represent the period of papal Rome during the 1260 years. Revelation 17 employs yet a third beast from the abyss to represent the papacy when its deadly wound is healed. Are three different beasts used for these three different periods? But now notice this also. If three beasts which arise in three different places are used to represent three different stages of Rome, then should, it should not surprise us that separate heads are used to depict those same stages. It is important to underline that the sixth head, which I believe to be the United States under apostate Protestantism, is symbolized by a separate beast as well, right? Is it a separate kingdom? Absolutely. And is related to Rome because it speaks like a dragon, and the dragon represents Satan working through Rome. Are you with me? Now, Ellen White clearly identifies the, the three persecuting powers in their proper historical sequence. Notice what she had to say in Signs of the Times, February 8, 1910. Under the symbols of the great red dragon, that's Revelation 12, right? A leopard-like beast, Revelation 13, and a beast with lamb-like horns, that's the United States, the earthly governments would, which would be especially engaged in trampling upon God's law and persecuting His people were presented to John. Their war is to be carried on till the close of time. The people of God, symbolized by a holy woman and her children, are represented as greatly in the minority. In the last days, only a remnant still exists. John speaks of them as those who keep the commands of, commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So you see that, that she mentions uh, the great red dragon, the leopard-like beast, the beast with lamb-like horns, and of course in many other places of her writings she mentions the healing of the deadly wound of the papacy and the papacy taking over power once again. Regarding the last head, notice what Ellen White had to say in volume 7 of the Testimonies, page 182. As we approach the last crisis, it is a vital moment that harmony and unity exist among the Lord's instrumentalities. The world is filled with storm and war and variance. Yet under one head, papal Rome, the papal power, the people will unite to oppose God in the person of His witnesses. So is the papacy considered one of those heads? It's the papacy uh, joining with what? With the civil powers of the world. Uh, and then we have this statement from Ellen White in uh, Signs of the Times, June 12, 1893, uh, when the land which the Lord provided as an asylum for His people, that they might worship Him according to the dictates of their own consciences, the land over which for long years the shield of omnipotence has been spread, the land which God has favored by making it the depository of the pure religion of Christ, when that land shall through its legislators abjure the principles of Protestantism and give countenance to Romish apostasy in tampering with God's law, it is then that the final work of the man of sin will be revealed. Who is the man of sin? The papacy, right? Protestants will throw their whole influence and strength on the side of whom? Of the papacy. So is the papacy going to rise to power? Is, the, is Protestant, this Protestant nation going to give its kingdom and its power to the papacy? Yes. She continues saying, by a national act enforcing the false Sabbath, they will give life and vigor to the corrupt faith of Rome. So who is the last power that's going to rule? It's not the United States. It's what? It's the re revived papacy. Uh, they will give life and vigor to the corrupt faith of Rome, reviving her tyranny and oppression of conscience, then it will be time for God to work in mighty power for the vindication of His truth. Some have wondered about the eighth head of the dragon beast. The simple fact is that this beast does not have eight heads. It has only seven, but the seventh head counts as an eighth. That is to say that head number seven bears the number eight. Time and again in Revelation 17, we are told that there are only seven heads on the dragon beast. Lewis Weir, in his book, and you need to get this book, um, you know, I'm not sure, we used to carry it, I don't know whether we carry it still, but you, you're able to get it from uh, Layman's Publications. Uh, in his book, 
the woman and the resurrected beast, uh, he shows very clearly that the number eight in Scripture time and again refers to resurrection or refers to new life. So why would the seventh head, why would the seventh head bear the number eight? Because this head is a previous head resurrected once again. Now, we're not going to deal with the dragon win wings. Uh, the dragon wings I already mentioned yesterday. In Revelation 17, the, this uh, dragon beast, it doesn't mention that it has wings. But uh, in, in antiquity, they also believed that when, when the river overflowed, it sprouted wings, like we read in Isaiah chapter 8 and also the last few verses of Daniel chapter 9. It speaks about, about the final destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. It says, on the wings of abomination shall come one who makes desolate. And in Daniel chapter 11, it speaks about the king of the north. When, he, when his wound heals, it says that he is going to overflow and he's going to flood. And so, uh, and so that concept, even though it's not contained in Revelation 17, I thought I would add it so that you could see this concept that we find in antiquity and also uh, is reflected in Scripture. Now let's talk about the ten horns. The ten horns are found on the head of the dragon beast of Revelation 12, on the head of the sea beast of Revelation 13, and on the head of the scarlet beast of Revelation 17. Whereas the seven heads are consecutive, the ten horns are contemporaneous. Do you know what contemporaneous means? They, it means that they rule all at the same time. Not, it's not one, one king after another uh, when it comes to the ten horns. They are on the, they are on the uh, fifth head, they're on the sixth head, and they're on the seventh head. And you'll notice many times illustrations are given of uh, the beast of Revelation chapter 13. And, you know, you have two horns on one head and one horn on another and three horns on another head. That's not the way it is. You have the ten horns all on one head. And the foundation for that is Daniel chapter 7. You have the dragon beast, and the dragon beast has what? Ten horns. They're all on the same head. <laughs> and they're all contemporaneous, right? So in Revelation 13, you have ten horns. They're all contemporaneous. Revelation chapter 17, you have ten horns, and they are all contemporaneous. <clears throat> uh, this is made clear by the fact that all ten horns will rule when they receive the kingdom simultaneously on the seventh head, because it says that all they will be of one mind, and they will all rule together. The ten horns are symbolic of ten kings. The ten kings represent kings of the earth and the whole world. This is a very important point, uh, and I'm going to dedicate a few moments to deal with this. Uh, do you remember that Revelation 17 is an amplification of the sixth plague? Remember we studied that yesterday? That, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, an angel comes back to explain to John the sixth plague because the harlot is sitting on many waters, and the many waters uh, are the Euphrates because she's called Babylon. So you have to go back to the plague that deals with the Euphrates. So you go back to Revelation chapter 16, and there you find uh, the waters are flowing, and there's a very interesting detail. It says that, that uh, three evil spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. The dragon represents the secular powers of the world. The beast represents the papacy. And the false prophet represents apostate Protestantism. Now, it, wh what do they do? Why do these evil spirits come out of the mouth of, of these three uh, of these three? Uh, entities at the end of time. What is their intention? What is their purpose? It says they're going to go to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them for the battle against God Almighty. So what would the ten kings represent? The ten kings of Revelation 17, which is an amplification of the sixth plague, would represent the kings of the earth and what? The kings of the earth and the whole world. So you're not dealing with ten individual kings. What you're dealing with is, and you know, Dr. Teske mentioned this, and, and it's a possibility that the world is divided into ten regions. And they will all come together, all of the rulers of the world in these ten divisions will come together to support this threefold union uh, in order to persecute God's people. So let's go back to our material here. Uh, the ten horns are symbolic of ten kings. The ten kings represent the kings of the earth and of the whole world. During the 1260 days or years, the ten to toes 
and the ten horns of Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 represented the nations of Western Europe. But at the end, the ten toes and the ten horns represent the kings of the earth and the whole world. Because at the end of time, things are globalized. Remember we studied that when we dealt with Daniel chapter 2? These kings will have one mind until the words of God are fulfilled. Do you know when the words of God are fulfilled? In the seventh plague when he says, it is done. So are they all going to be together until the battle of Armageddon? The battle of Armageddon takes place under the seventh plague. Are they all going to be of the same mind? They're all going to be on the same page? Oh, yeah. And what, what is their intent? What will their intent be? They're going to be united to do what? To persecute God's people. And so it says these kings have one mind until the words of God are fulfilled. The kings represent the rulers of the Christian world who under the leadership of apostate Protestantism and Catholicism will influence the state to enact and enforce a Sunday law. When this happen, happens, they will all be what? On the same page. Are we to understand that there will be just ten nations in this universal union? No. The number ten is what? is symbolic of all. I'm not going to go through all of this list that we have here because uh, we need to finish this material within the time constraints of this hour because I don't want to come back to this. But, you know, you can read these verses. Uh, for example, uh, the ten camels uh, that are mentioned in Genesis 24 verse 10 refers to all of a Abraham's goods. Uh, in Luke 19 verse 13, ten servants are symbolic of what? Of all Christians. The ten virgins are symbolic of all believers. Ten percent of your income means that you're tithing, what, that you're recognizing that how much belongs to God, that all belongs to God. In the Ten Commandments, you have the whole duty of man, according to Scripture. So, so ten just simply means the kings of the earth and the whole world. It means all of the powers of the world are going to come together because we're dealing with symbols. Notice the next statement that we find here, volume 3 of Selected Messages, page 392. Uh, this is amazing what Ellen White comments on here. She's really commenting on Revelation chapter 17 because she actually quotes Revelation 17 here. She says, The so-called Christian world is to be the theater of great and decisive actions. Men in authority, are these politicians? Yes. Men in authority will enact laws controlling the conscience. Is this the church controlling the state? Yes. After the example of whom? Oh, the papacy. Babylon will make all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Every nation will be involved. See, every nation, right? All. Every nation will be involved. That, 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 those, that's the number 10. Of this time, John the Revelator declares, and then she quotes Revelation 18, 3 to 7, and Revelation 17, 13 and 14. These have one mind there will be a universal bond of union. Three, three phrases where she is referring to the same thing, three ways of expressing the same thought. There will be a universal bond of union, one great harmony, a confederacy of Satan's forces. Are we seeing this coming together today? You better believe we are. Just 193 nations at the United Nations giving the Pope a standing ovation. It's amazing. She continues writing, uh, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. She's quoting Revelation 17. Thus is manifested the same arbitrary oppressive power against religious liberty, freedom to worship God according to the dictates of conscience, as was, was manifested by the papacy when in the past it persecuted those who dared to refuse to conform with the religious rites and ceremonies of Romanism. So do we have a past stage and a future stage? Are you seeing what Revelation 17 is talking about? Folks, Revelation 17 is talking about now. Yeah. It's talking about now. We can see this transpiring and coming together in our day and age. Do you believe that? Yeah. In the light of what we're studying? Right. Now, notice uh, what we have here in this statement, volume 7 of the Testimonies, page 183. We are told that these kings will make war with the Lamb. Now, we need to understand that, that these nations, these Christian nations, are not going to make war against Jesus directly. You know, they claim to be Christian. Be real. Don't they claim to be Christians? 
course they claim these are Christian nations, Ellen White says, that are going to come together to oppress God's people under the leadership of the papacy, under the headship of the papacy. So it's not that these Christians are saying, oh, we're going to fight against Jesus. No. How do they fight against Jesus? They fight against Jesus in the person of his witnesses. Notice this statement, volume 7 of the Testimonies, 183. It's like the Battle of Armageddon. You know, the Battle of Armageddon, you know, some evangelicals, they write in their books that when Jesus is coming on the clouds, the wicked are shooting nuclear weapons at Jesus. Please be real. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is that the, the powers of the earth at the end of time are going to war against Christ in the person of his people. Because whoever wars against his people wars, wars against God. Because Jesus is the head and the church is his body. By fighting the head, they're fighting the body. And by fighting the body, they're fighting the head. Jesus is the shepherd and we are his sheep. Whoever touches his sheep touches the shepherd. Jesus is the husband and the church is his wife. If the wicked want to beat up his wife, Jesus says, hey, I take that personally. Because Jesus has a covenant relationship with his people. Amen. That's why with Saul of Tarsus, you know, <laughs> Saul of Tarsus is going to, uh, he, he's going to uh, Damascus to persecute Christians. And, uh, you know, he falls to the ground when he sees this bright light. And he hears a voice that says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Yeah. And, and Saul is thinking, well, I didn't know that Damascus was up. <laughs> what, what does it mean? Why do you persecute me? In persecuting the people of God, he was persecuting the God of the people. Notice this. As we approach the last crisis, it is a vital moment that harmony and unity exist among the Lord's instrumentalities. The world is filled with storm and war and variance. Yet under one head, the papal power, the people will unite to oppose God in the person of his witnesses. This union is cemented by the great apostate. Will God have a faithful people? Yes. Ah, Revelation 17 verse 14 says that those are, that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. This will be the faithful generation. Now the story doesn't end here. Are the waters that the harlot sits on going to dry up on her? This is the final drying up of the Euphrates uh, in, in, when it comes to the papacy specifically. Ellen White describes this moment when the Euphrates is going to dry up. By the way, this is not the river Euphrates in Iraq. What does the river Euphrates represent that the harlot sits upon? Multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples, and her name is Babylon. So if the waters means that, you know, through the civil powers of the world, she's able to use those waters commanded by the kings to persecute God's people. What would the drying up of the waters represent? It means that her support base is what? Gone. Just like happened with ancient Babylon. See, when Cyrus dried up the riverbed of the Euphrates, Babylon fell. Because the Euphrates, Euphrates was her support. It was her power base. As long as the Euphrates was flowing, Babylon was safe. But if she lost her river, Babylon would fall. Now notice how Ellen White describes this climatic moment when the kings will turn against the harlot. Great controversy, page 635 and 636. First of all, God's people are going to be in jeopardy. With shouts of triumph, jeering and implication, Throngs of evil men are about to rush upon their prey. What does the word rush bring to your mind? Water. What is that rushes? Water. Yes. This is, the, this is when the waters are flowing freely. When lo, a dense blackness, this is the fifth plague, deeper than the darkness of the night falls upon the earth. Then a rainbow shining with the glory from the throne of God spans the heavens and seems to encircle each praying company. The angry multitudes are suddenly arrested. What is that? That's a drying up of the waters, folks. The, the, it, it, she says here that the multitudes are about to rush upon God's people. It's waters that rush. And then she says that the darkness falls and suddenly the multitudes are what? arrested. That is the drying up of the waters. Their mocking cries die away 
the objects of their murderous rage are forgotten. With fearful forebodings, they gaze, gaze upon the symbol of God's covenant and long to be shielded from its overpowering brightness. Then a little later on, in the next chapter of the desolation of the earth, she explains what happens when the waters dry up. This is page 656. The people see that they have been deluded. The waters see that they have been deluded, right? They accuse one another of having led them to destruction, but all unite in heaping their bitterest condemnation upon the ministers. Unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things. They have led their hearers to make void the law of God and to persecute those who would keep it holy. Is this talking about the religious systems, the ministers of the religious systems? Yes, that deceive the harlot that deceive people and the daughters that deceive people? Absolutely. Now in their despair, these teachers confess before the world their work of deception. The multitudes, that's the waters folks, right? The multitudes are filled with fury. We are lost, they cry, and you are the cause of our ruin. And they turn upon the false shepherds. That is the turning of the kings against this system. Because not only the multitudes will, but the kings that led the multitudes will as well. The very ones that once admired them most will pronounce the most dreadful curses upon them. The very hands that once crowned them with laurels will be raised for their destruction. The so swords which were to slay God's people are now employed to destroy their enemies. Everywhere there is strife and bloodshed. Are you understanding what Revelation 17 is all about? Do you know what is central to Revelation chapter 17? It's not the harlot, although she's the main protagonist in most of the story. It's not the kings of the earth. It's not the daughters of the harlot. It's not the persecution. What is central to Revelation chapter 17 is the deliverance of God's people. <laughs> Those who are called and chosen and faithful. It says the Lamb will fight against the powers of the earth and the Lamb will overcome them because He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That is the good news. God's people will be what? Delivered everyone who is found written in the book. Do you see Daniel 12 and verse 1 contained in this sequence here? Daniel 12, Michael stands up. That's the close of probation. What comes as a result? The time of trouble such as never has been seen. But at the time of trouble it says, your people shall be what? Delivered. Delivered. And then it says, those who sleep in the dust of the earth will arise. That's the special resurrection. Mm -hmm. So you have the same sequence in Revelation chapter 17. We are told in Revelation 17, 11, that the beast will go to perdition. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, we are told that the man of sin will go into perdition. And Judas is called the son of perdition. And Judas is a symbol of the papal power. You, can, uh, you have this in your syllabus, a very long study on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But there's a final drying up of the waters. And this is not contemplated in the prophecy of Revelation 17, because this is going to take place after the millennium. Uh, but I decided to include it here uh, so that you can, uh, you, you can understand that there's going to be a final drying up of the waters. Let me ask you, who is it that used the powers of the earth to persecute God's people at the end of time? Who is definitely behind the scenes? Satan. Do the wicked turn against Satan uh, d at this time? No. They don't turn against Satan here. Who do they turn against? They turn against the, of the, the powers that Satan used, right? The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. They turn against them. So who gets off scot-free? The guy who's in the background. Ah, but now notice, after the millennium, the wicked will gather around the holy city. Just like they gathered around God's people on the earth before the second coming. And what will their intention be? Their intention will be to conquer the holy city and destroy those who are inside. And then you'll have this wonderful judgment scene where the wicked will see the record of their lives. They will see the whole history of the world, the opportunities that God gave them to be saved. And once they have seen the record, they say, God is right and we're wrong. God is just and he's loving. He gave us every chance in the world. 
to be converted, to, to accept him as our Savior, to be inside the holy city. And then they say, hmm, who's really the guilty one? That guy over there. <laughs> the wicked do not die attacking the holy city. This is a myth. Sometimes the Adventist church has these myths that we have, you know, that the wicked, when they're attacking the city, fire falls from heaven and destroys them. The wicked never attack the city. Read the last, chap last chapter of Great Controversy, and the foundation that Ellen White is using is Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 2 through 8, where it clearly says that the nations will arise against this individual, who this covering cherub that is spoken of there, and they will unsheath their swords against him. Because the judgment will show that he is the one that caused everything that happened in the earth. He deceived everyone. And they say, you are to blame. And Ellen White describes it. She says that they will turn upon him in rage. In other words, the waters that the devil used will be what? Will be dried up for Satan. And then, of course, Satan and the wicked will be destroyed. And God will create a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. I want to read this, this statement in closing, Great Controversy 671, where Ellen White describes this climactic moment of the Great Controversy. Satan rushes into the midst of his subjects and endeavors to inspire them with his own fury and arouse them to instant battle. But of all the countless millions whom he has allured into rebellion, there are none now to acknowledge his supremacy. His power is at an end. Is this true of the systems that he used before the second coming? Yes. The wicked are filled with the same hatred of God that inspires Satan, but they see that their case is hopeless, that they cannot prevail against Jehovah. Their rage is kindled against Satan, and those who have been his agents in deception and with fury of demons, they turn upon them. That is the climax of the great controversy between good and evil. The whole universe will be on the same page because once the wicked say that God was right, the righteous have already said that God is right, all of the heavenly beings have said that God is right, all of the universe is on the same page. God was right and Satan was wrong. I did a series recently called the Great Cosmic Controversy, where I deal with how God solves the sin problem in the sanctuary, where I deal with all these matters. It's spectacular how God will eventually vindicate His character before the entire universe. Visit secretsunsealed.org for annual class dates and topics. Anchor is a seminary-level course of study on the fundamentals of Seventh-day Adventist theology taught by Pastor Stephen Bohr and guest theologians. Seating is limited.